Kill Zone, Outlaw Golf 2, and in Versus, it's Conflict Vietnam against Men of Valor. Some of the games we look at on Reviews on the Run are intended for a mature audience. Please pay attention to each game's ESRB rating. Okay, it is arguably the biggest PlayStation 2 game of the year. Everybody's been waiting for this one. Everybody's talking about this one. This is Grand Theft Auto San Andreas from Rockstar for the PlayStation 2. What do you think, man? Now, there's going to be a lot of people out there who are, are going to object to the content of the game. And, you know, and I'm a pretty hardcore guy when it comes to this stuff. Yep. Some of the violence and the material in the game, I mean, I gotta be honest with you, it did kind of go shocking. over the top it's and it was a little shocking. shocking. But listen, man, the guys at Rockstar have always worked within the parameters of the fiction that they're that they're dealing with. And this time they're, they're taking, taking it to it, the hood. They're going to the hood and they're emulating things that you've seen in Boys in the Hood or Menace to Society, you know, these sort of gangster rap kind of movies, you yeah. know, in that kind of lifestyle. I mean, and it's very realistic. They really went realistic. Absolutely, and they're just emulating the, the fiction that they've seen. And I would agree with you. It's just that as I'm playing this game thinking for the first time that, you know, there, there is going to be younger kids who are going to be playing this game, and it's like... And they shouldn't be. Wow. Now that we got all that political stuff out of the yeah. game, let's get into it. it Boy, is, is it fun it to do so a drive-by shooting. It is fun. <laughs> it's ridiculously fun. All of the, the chaos that you can create in this game is oh, going to blow you away. It is absolutely amazing all of the things that you get to do at your own pace. Yes. You know? Well, what they've done is they've amplified the action sort of elements in the game. Now you can climb up walls and it really feels you like you're being... You can swim. You can swim. But I love the, the fact that just climbing, what a difference it makes that you can sort of scramble up walls as right. you're being chased by cops, yeah, you know? Yeah. The Grand Theft Auto universe here now is broken up into three distinct cities. You've got the Los Angeles type city, the San, San Francisco. Francisco type city, and then you've got the Las Vegas type city. The big news in this game is that they've kind of added a bit of a the Sims element yep. uh, in here a little bit. You now have to eat, and you have a stat meter as well yep. that you can bring up at any time. Now, you can work out in the game, and you can start to get ripped, and if you don't work out and you constantly eat, you'll get fat. You're right. It kind of feels a little bit like The Sims, but I was also kind of reminded of Fable in that you know, right. all of these things, all this customization of the content really comes into play. And it was amazing to see how deep of an RPG type experience this is. One of the things though I would like to have seen them uh, do a little differently is, is have the map in yeah. the little left hand corner the map, I would have liked to have seen it a little bigger. It's a it was, little confusing. It was kind of hard in order to get, because the city is so big, yeah. it was kind of hard to like work your way around sometimes. Absolutely. You've got some amazing voice actors in the cast. James Woods is in there. Yeah. Samuel L. Jackson is in there. You got music by guys like uh, Dr. Dre. And Willie, Nelson. Willie, Nelson. Willie Nelson. Willie Nelson. Axel Rose is one of the DJs on the thing. Right. The script is the strongest script we've ever seen in a GTA game. When you go out and start terrorizing average people, like like I always do. Yeah. You know the dialogue as well. They have a lot of you know voiceover. It gets a little repetitive. It gets a little repetitive. There's but there's some, so many people. There's some frame rate issues where it sort of bogs down a little bit. But man, you have to forgive this game for the amount of content it's delivering. Yeah. It's going to have a few little technical kind of snafus. If you own a PlayStation 2. If you're over 17, this game definitely has to be in your library. I'm giving GTA San Andreas 10 out of 10. I'm giving it a 9.5. On the positive side, this game features the best storyline in the GTA series so far. The voice acting is incredible. And really, the fact that you get three huge cities to travel around in, plus all of the countryside to see, this game will just blow you away. On the negative side, this game really is close to perfection, but there were a few things that we would have liked to have seen better. The cities are so huge that we would have liked to have seen the little map icon cover a little more area. And finally, the content is so edgy and adult orientated, it may turn some players off. Make sure you're 17 or over. No question about it, Grand Theft Auto rocks, but when we come back, we're talking about another big PlayStation 2 game. Kill Zone after the break. Rockstar Games presents Grand Theft Auto 3. Out now on 
PlayStation 2 and Xbox as part of the Double Pack with Grand Theft Auto Vice City. Rated M for Mature. Hey, how's it going, guys? I've got my DS out here, and I've got the weirdest combination of games. I have Super Mario DS and Grand Theft Auto Advance on the same machine. I'm going to talk about Grand Theft Auto, which is one of my favorite topics in video games. I love the GTA games. And I got to say, I'm really impressed for the Game Boy Advance version of Grand Theft Auto. They've done a very good job. Rockstar went to the developers of Digital Eclipse to create this game and it's using the top-down perspective. It's the same kind of stuff that you would get on the console versions, on the bigger brother type versions, but this time, you know, you're looking down on all the vehicles. And of course, you can hop out of your vehicle and pick up all kinds of weapons and start blasting away at uh, enemies, pedestrians if you're a psychopath, cops that ch start chasing you. GTA Advance is a lot of fun. It's definitely something to pick up for your DS or your Game Boy Advance. It is a mature rated title though, keep that in mind. It's a terrific game though. I'm gonna give it an 8.5 out of 10. We are back and our look at gigantic games it continues with Kill Zone. Right. This one is developed by Guerrilla Games and published by Sony for the PlayStation 2. And Kill Zone has been hyped as the, the Halo, Halo killer. killer. Nah. nah. It doesn't even come close to the original Halo, in right. my opinion, right. let alone Halo 2. Well, the thing is, when you're so used to seeing the Xbox in all its glory, yeah. you look at a game on the PS2 like this, which has good graphics. Beautiful graphics. But it's just that it's it's, it's a choppy. little... And, and it's not so choppy that, you know, if you never played the Xbox stuff, you'd probably think it was fine. Absolutely. You know? And if you don't have an Xbox, right. then you're looking at one of the sweetest-looking first-person shooters for the PlayStation 2. And Killzone... Although it has a lot of interesting elements and there's a lot of really nice finesse to this game, it also brings a whole bunch of problems to the table, you know? I mean, my biggest gripe with this game is that just the fact of reloading your gun in between getting attacked by the enemies... It takes a while, doesn't it? It takes way too long. It really kind of put me into this battle that was going on, yeah. you know? Like, the like war I would be, is going on around you. In games like this, you want to be sucked in, you want to be totally. drawn in, and it does that. And they use great technical things like, you know, blurring video as as all of this shell fire is coming in. Right. You've got awesome audio effects. <laughs> now, speaking of the levels, they did mix things up quite a bit. They have beautiful kind of beachfront sort of attack situations like this where the water is crashing in against the shore. I thought that was awesome. They've got beautiful tundra kind of environments, jungle, swampy kind of levels, yeah. lots of urban levels. And the other cool thing that they've added in this game through the single player campaign is you're able to play as four different characters at the start of any given mission. So you've got the, the, the main guy who's named Templar, who's kind of like, you know, the guy that can do a little bit of everything. Luger is the stealth chick who can walk in. No, no, like the handgun Luger, oh. not the Lugie. Oh. Rico's the giant guy that carries the big guns. And then you've got this mutant dude named Haka. My biggest problem, though, with this game yeah. was I thought that the targeting it was, was it a was little yeah. too touchy. Yeah, absolutely. And that is the biggest downfall of this game is that, you know, I want to be able to... especially, man. sniper mode is, is near... Now, it's cool mode, but it's near impossible well, you to know get your crosshair exactly on the spot you want it to. It reminded me of playing uh, ESPN basketball and trying to get, the, you know, sync the, uh, the free throws. Oh, yeah. You know right. what I'm talking about? Where it's just yeah. like... It's so frustrating, it's frustrating that you can't yeah. line it perfectly. A lot of times the companies don't put the production money and value into this. Yeah. This game Had has it. all those things. It has the great music. It has the great menu. Well, they were art, going you know? after Halo. It's easy to see that yeah. they were targeting Halo. One thing that drove me nuts, there's no jump button in the game. 
and you'll be walking up to like curbs and you and you have to find an alternate ramp yeah. to get up to the, yeah. like you can't make first person shooter games without a jump button. Yeah, what's I'm the problem so, I'm there? sorry man well, why not uh, it's, it's just... but they do have the context sensitive action button that lets you scramble over top of things every once in a while right just right. only what they want you to scramble over you know problem i had was that it was actually hard a lot of the times to figure out who was on your team and yeah. who wasn't i mean it was it was hard to they're all to, just gray blocky yeah and they're the all distance. kind of black yeah. and dark and i didn't know who was on my i didn't know who i was supposed to be shooting and who i wasn't right you know what i mean i'm giving kill zone an eight it's exactly what i give it as well okay eight. On the positive side, the production values of Killzone are very impressive. Some good multiplayer gameplay in there. And although it's not a Halo killer, it's still one of the best first-person shooter experiences you can find for the PlayStation 2. On the negative side, the frame rate isn't as smooth as other console games. The aiming is a little too sensitive. And it's hard to tell who your enemies are. All right, now we've got a PlayStation 2 controller to tell you guys about. This is the Pelican Afterglow controller. We looked at the PlayStation 2 version, although they've made ones for the GameCube and the Xbox as well. I got to be honest with you, we're getting close for me to get the Tron <laughs> controller. <laughs> Absolutely. This glows blue. Yes, it does. Like Tron what? blue. That's right. Pretty much patterned exactly after the, uh, the regular DualShock analog controller that, that Sony's made, except they've got... The R2 and L2 buttons it's are shifted down. Un underneath, more like the Xbox trigger kind of Right, controls. which which feels which it's feels okay. good. It's you know, right. I mean, yeah, it, it, you're not used to it because you're so used to yep. this on the top. Yep. But it actually feels good. What, what I like about it is, is that nice. it def differentiates the buttons quite well so that you can memorize the exact location. Because I don't know about you, but I've pressed the R1 when I've wanted Thinking the R2. That it's, you're right. All the buttons are tight. The, the, the joy pad is tight. Yep. The, the sticks are nice. The little face buttons are I think a tad too close together so you can hit See, I like that because I got time. smaller hands but I didn't mind that too much it's not that big of a difference I mean I played some GTA with the with the controller and I thought it was pretty good the price points only 20 bucks I gotta say for a gimmick it, it's fun if you want something that glows in the dark this is your controller I'm, I'm gonna recommend it I'm gonna recommend it as well I like this one and it's the closest thing I have to Tron! On the positive side, this controller feels really good in your hands, even with the L2 and R2 buttons being lowered. It's only 20 bucks, but the best thing is that it glows like Tron. On the negative side, who else is sick of hearing Tommy say Tron? Did I mention I'm sick of Tommy saying Tron? And I really hate when Tommy says Tron. Stick around. After the break, an old favorite game returns with some new enhancements. Pong? And we're not just talking the silicone variety, Outlaw Golf 2. Ooh, humana, 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 humana. the Nintendo GameCube for only $149.95 and receive The Legend of Zelda The Wind Waker. Go ahead, take it. Shh. And a playable bonus disc. Free. Be Games. We take games seriously. All right, now this game, Deus Ex Invisible War or DX2, it was unjustly criticized for not living up to the original Deus Ex, which is one of the best games of all time. 
Now this one's, it's not just a shooter. There's all kinds of weapons and cool objects that you pick up and you can blast away at bad guys, but you play an augmented anti-terrorist dude and you can actually do all kinds of great things with all of these internal kind of augmentations that are built into yourself. One of the decisions that they made that kind of screwed things up a little bit is that they used ammunition that was useful for all the weapons in the game, which kind of sucked because you would run out of sniper bullets all of a sudden, but it kind of used up all of the ammo for all your other weapons at the same time. Incredibly detailed, intense script with some decent voiceover acting. This one is going to keep you engaged. Deus Ex 2 Invisible War or DX2. We are back and we are talking about the sequel to one of Tommy's favorite golf games of all time. This is Outlaw Golf 2. And uh, we're taking a look at this one on the Xbox, although it's available for the PlayStation 2 as well. What did you think of Outlaw Golf 2? Well, I got to say, like, right off the bat, yeah. you, you choose all these characters, and it's wacky. It's a wacky golf game. You got to pick Summer yes. and Autumn as her caddy. Right. I got to say that this is the hottest yeah. and most beautiful video game character Right. Better than Tomb Raider. Better yes. than Lara Croft. Yes. Can we do me a favor here? Yeah, I just want to run some of the... Let's appreciate even the menu screen. I'm sitting on the menu screen for like 10 minutes. Roll tape. I'm, I'm speechless. Go ahead. Talk. It's pretty hard. I'm just thinking about it. Is Don't expect Tiger Woods. Don't expect Mario Golf. That this being is, said, though, this is Grand Theft Auto meets golf. The golf thing isn't that bad. You think it's, it's going to be just a bad. little throwaway kind of golf experience, but it actually is kind of fun to play the thing. It's but, pretty challenging. The AI is pretty solid. The There's some online play, which is right. impressive. But the best thing is you can actually take the ball yep. and hit it into the crowd. Oh, and they're it, running away. And it knocks people over, and you get points for you that. You get bonus points. And when you get enough bonus points, you can take your club out of the bag and start whacking the hell out of your caddy. This is a beautiful thing. It's impressive that they, they came out at 20 bucks US for the game, and they're giving you more than twice as many courses to play on than they did in the first Outlaw Golf. You get eight now instead of three. Right. And the variety in the courses is pretty cool. You get like the Jersey one and you get the desert one and uh, there's a, like an ice one and a haunted house. Freeway. I like the uh, I like the, the psychedelic mushroom one. I bet with, you did. It's kind of like Mario-esque kind of weird you know, psychedelic Because it mushrooms. reminded you of Mario Golf? It is that why? It kind of did. It, yeah. it kind of has some of and those Especially with looping. those strippers in the game. Yeah. This, that kind of reminds you of Mario this, Golf too, didn't it? The strippers it? and the bikers. And I like the uh, rappers, the Ice Trey and his, uh, his, Ice homeboy, Trey. his homeboy caddy, Fresh Fruit. One of the biggest problems in the game I felt was that the camera angles, I would have liked to have seen a little farther back. You never really get that Tiger Woods really good sense of how you're hitting it. And then once you do hit the ball, the camera follows you like exactly behind the ball. And the problem with that is, is that I want to see the ball going so I can see kind of relative to where I am at the hole. Where and your it, next it, shot is going to exactly. go. Exactly. I found putting was quite difficult, actually. I thought that it was it was very tricky. See, I could never really get the sense of it. You can press the uh, the X the button. The X button. And you get a, this a, a is revolutionary for a second. But then if you move it, it disappears. That's it, right. But the, the big thing is, is that they give you three tries. So yeah. a lot of the holes will have like a curve to it. Yep. And you have to figure out where this white line goes. It was difficult. It was But difficult. it was so unique in that you could have three tries yep. to line it up. And then and then you just had to guess after that. Well, but, I guess what was tough, though, is that you play against the AI. And, the, and it's not dumb. All the computer-controlled characters are actually pretty good players. So winning the single-player tournaments takes some practice. But you do feel like you are getting better as you play the game. Now, there's a lot of good humor in the game. Yeah. And then some of it's, it, it's iffy. It's about 50-50. We're about to witness some senseless violence, my favorite kind. <laughs> the best thing that you can say about Outlaw Golf 2 is that it delivers a good golf experience. It's funny. And it's value-packed. And it's better than you think it's going to be. I'm giving it a 7. I'm going to give it a 7.5. On the positive side, the graphics in the game are really good especially when you're looking at summer and autumn. The online play is pretty robust, and the cool mini games like beating the hell out of your caddies never get old. On the negative side, the camera angles are a little tough to deal with, and although there's some good jokes in the game, there's some dodgy ones as well. 
All right, we're going from wacky golf to yeah. Vietnam. We've got men of valor versus conflict Vietnam after the break. Hopefully Summer will be in that game as well. I don't think so. Damn. Our favorite sci-fi flavored first person shooters. Number one is Red Faction 2. Number two, Unreal Tournament 2004. Number three, Time Splitters 2. Number four, Halo. And number five, Doom 3. All right, we are back in the jungles of Vietnam, and yes. it scares me that we are, because all the Vietnam games we've played have been really bad. But here we are talking about two new ones, Men of Valor against Conflict Vietnam. Yes. We looked at both of them on the Xbox. How do you think the visuals are for these two titles? Well, I, I got to say that Men of Valor is absolutely phenomenal. I mean, when you're in the jungle brush, it really gives you a sense of you know being in this in in the thick of things one thing that really bothered me about men of valor yes was the water yeah what the heck i know you thinking it looked just well, like a glass and it didn't move i'm like running i know i know through it and it just there's things in both games where they kind of really? dropped the ball the characters moved really weird i thought in conflict vietnam oh. Thought they were a little bit too cumbersome, and yeah, exactly. And you're like yeah. trying to move this way, and, yep. they, and they walk this way. Totally, absolutely. Yeah. That was that drove me crazy. And also in Men of yeah. Valor, because it's from the same guys, 2015, that did the uh, Medal of Medal of Honor uh, Allied Assault game for the PC. Mo. It, it looked like that. It looked just like they took all of those models and that kind of look. But they did add some great visual effects. To men of valor that i was very impressed by i mean you, when you see the big explosions and everything oh. is shaking and uh, you know or, or you take a it bunch really of hits puts you there. yeah i mean it, it really puts you in the experience it's which really is a nice. scary awful experience but it was it's real and i thought in conflict vietnam i thought that was pretty cool as well because and, uh, to me that played more like a video game because it was more third person right so what what do you think what, I, what are you going to say I visually give, i gotta give the visual nod to men of valor i really do uh, even he, though i hated the water yeah still they they did everything else really nice. it was the effects for me in men of valor that i liked the most that really made it bring everything to life but i didn't mind the look of conflict vietnam at all no, me either I, you know, by a hair, I'm going to give it to Men of Valor. Audio-wise, how did these two stack up? Well, you know, it's all about using the F word, yeah. I find. Lots it, of swearing. It, in these, in these yeah. Vietnam games. Authentic dialogue. I like the authentic languages as well in right. Men of Valor were incredible. I mean, you heard the Vietnamese Definitely shouting Definitely Conflict Vietnam is a little stuff. cleaner than uh, Men of Valor. It's not as gritty, gritty and edgy as, as it is. Now, for the music, both games used some licensed music and some original music as yep. well. But the interactive score was recorded with a live orchestra by Enon Zur. Awesome. Isn't that a fun name to I say? I love that guy. Say that name. Awesome. Enon Zur. Isn't wasn't he great? a character in Robotron? No. He was one of the dudes, wasn't he? <laughs> no? Men of Valor wins the audio award there. Now, Absolutely. talk about gameplay. How do you think these two stood up against each other? I gotta say, I loved Men of Valor. Yeah. I, mean, I felt like I was in that war. Like, you know, they've added like, a lot of the scripted I, kind like, of stuff that we're seeing in Call of Duty and Medal of Honor. These guys know that like, kind if of I'm world. in a field or in the brush, yeah. and then all of a sudden, one of my guys would just boom, get cut down. Both and games presented that. Screaming and stuff. I agree with you. Men of Valor did a very good job of doing that stuff. Conflict Vietnam gave me some of that same rush as well. See, the problem with that, though, is that the controls it's were very so cumbersome. lame. They're very cumbersome. I mean, I couldn't even figure out the map screen. It was so screwed up. Like, yeah. they have this map screen, but you never really know where you're pointing. So, Every three seconds, I had to pause it and go in this direction. And, and, and am I going the right way? No. Yeah. I, it was very confusing. There's just too much action going on. It's a very easy game to play, but you have to take control of all four characters right. when you're playing by yourself. And it's just too much going on. It is a split screen up to four player game as well. And you can play through the game together. Everybody taking on different roles. People can be medics and, and sort of support you in these battles. And all that stuff kind of adds some real fun to the game. But what Men of Valor counters with is they actually have online support. So even in the multiplayer arena, I think Men of Valor wins that one too. I, I agree. Out of all the console games out there, I gotta say Men of Valor is the best one this year for Vietnam. I'm giving it a 9. I'm giving uh, Men of Valor an 8. And what are you going to give Conflict Vietnam? I'm giving that a six. The controls really blew it for me. I, I, didn't, I didn't mind it that much. I'm going to give it a 7 out of 10. So there you have it. The Vietnam games are getting better. If you're looking for the best one to get right now, pick Men up of Men of Valor. Valor.
Today on the show, we took a look at Grand Theft Auto San Andreas. This is the best Grand Theft Auto game so far with the most things to do, but the edgy content is definitely not for kids. Killzone. Great production values in this first-person shooter, but there's some lame frame rate problems that bog things down. Outlaw Golf 2. It's always great to see summer and autumn, and the online play is pretty good in this one, but there's some dodgy jokes in here as well. In Versus, we took a look at Conflict Vietnam, which allows you to play as four characters at once in some pretty chaotic gameplay, against Men of Valor, which delivers solid first-person shooter action not too dissimilar from Call of Duty or Medal of Honor. The Battle of the Vietnam Games this week was won by Men of Valor. You can play single-player bot matches as well, so you can kind of get prepared. Bot for matches? Up. Bot matches. Oh! Bot matches. That would be pretty funny. Look, it's a bot match. Yeah, easy. It's a bot match. Insanity, a strange twist of fate is forced Crash and the evil Dr. Cortex to team up. And there are some sweet moves in this game like Roller Brawl. Allow us to demonstrate. <laughs> Take control of an orange daredevil and evil genius using bone crushing team moves. Just because they're working together doesn't mean they gotta like it. Something went wrong. Crash to Insanity, rated E for everyone. Hey, my name is Jada Pinkett Smith, and you're watching G4. One team's gonna get knocked out. It's time to find out who's got the stuff of champions on another episode of Arena! to Arena, the show that turns multiplayer games into competitive sports. I'm Lee Raymond, and we've got two teams that are about to go toe-to-toe -to -toe in our own virtual squared circle. Today we'll drop the hammer on the console with Burnout 2, then we'll shoot on over to the PC with Unreal Tournament 2003. Finally, we wrap things up with America's Army Special Forces. We play it on Atlanta Cyberspace's Virtual Reality Pod. Before we get started, let's go to Kevin Pereira, who's got some explaining to do. The Law of Arena. Kevin. Thank you very much, Lee. Here on Arena, there are nine possible points to be won. The console game is worth one point, while each PC game is worth two. Now, the team with the highest accumulated score will pick up a point, and the team with the MVP will rack up an additional three points. And those, my good citizens, are the laws here in Arena. Now, let's check in with my good friend, Stacy Barcelata, for our player introductions. Thanks, Kevin. On the last episode of Arena, Team Kaizen made its first title defense against Team Augury, and Max UT 2003 skills were just too much as Kaizen successfully retained the crown. So today, they're going up against a new challenger, the Last Minute Men. Let's take a second look. I got my nickname from a team player who was a good friend of mine back in Puerto Rico. I used to play a lot of land and I kill silently. And I usually go out at night, so that gave me the silent night. I like to play games. I started playing games since I was little, since I think eight years old. I will eliminate you. It was kind of a inside high school joke. Uh, my friends used to laugh about the prospect of me driving a Pinto. I thought Pinto Extreme sounded pretty funny. I game for fun, it's my hobby. As a job, I sell knives, which is the most kick-ass job I've ever had. We're gonna open up a can of whoop-ass on you guys. I go to school, I come home, uh, I talk with friends. Uh, I'm a typical teenager, I guess. I like games like Counter-Strike if they're played for real, so to speak. Uh, I don't think a player is good if he just, like, 
finds some cheap tactic and exploits it. I don't know. I, just, I play for real. I don't like doing all these other things. Uh, sandwichi means sandwich in Japanese. Last minute man is because we kind of just all got together at the last minute. I think we have a good chance. You guys are going to die. I'm going to kill you all. I play video games instead of watching TV, pretty much. It's my entertainment. And instead of sitting and wasting an hour watching a movie or something I've already seen, I'll just play video games. Nice escape. We're just gonna win. First game I remember playing, uh, probably Street Fighter 2. It's the most memorable game in the past. Right now I've been playing a lot of uh, Star Wars Galaxies. Still play a lot of Unreal Tournament. It's gonna be, yeah. Uh... I play video games about 10, 20 hours a week. My girlfriend thinks I'm a dork pretty much, but you know, she supports me. If I had to choose between video games and my girlfriend, I will choose my girlfriend. I've cut back lately in video games. I play water polo. I've been having a lot of water polo practice in school. Probably only playing around like five hours a day max. <laughs> this kind of sucks. All right, we're starting things off here in the console pit where all four players from each team will get a chance to make a difference as they'll each take a turn at the game. Today's game is Burnout 2 Point of Impact and it'll be played on the Xbox. Now this paint trading title is part racing game and part demolition derby. It may not be pretty, but hey, neither is Lee, so it's a perfect fit for this show. So let's get to the action in Burnout 2 Point of Impact. One. And first up, for our defending champions, Kaizen is Eska, and right into the back of a bus he goes. And sadly for his team, that's the only place he went, was right into the back of that single bus. And even with the bonus of a multiplier of two, a tragic score for Eska, a little over $400,000. And Silent Knight behind the wheel of the blue car for last minute men. Going full speed, using all of his boost meter, and he slams into the back of a white van. And somehow his bonus multiplier is only a factor of one. Hold on. Oh! oh! And just in the nick of time, Taxi Cab sneaks in there, gives him a love tap. Approximately $200,000, but that'd have been much worse, Kevin, without that last slight impact. So he lost anyways? Lost anyway. OK, just check. Two. For Kaizen, it's the Mac Daddy. Oh! <laughs> Perfect timing as he T-bones the Greyhound, Lee. But as dramatic as it was, unfortunately, the impact was prettier than the damage oh! inflicted. Oh! And apparently That's the truck driver hard. was paying a little too much attention to the initial incident as he slams into the guardrail, giving Mac and Team Kaizen quite a break. Damage assessment at just shy of 416,000. It'll be about a million and a quarter. And Pinto Extreme. Flying through traffic, clips the back of a taxi, and that causes a chain reaction with two vans as the taxi skids its way, hopefully, into oncoming traffic. His number to beat is one and a quarter million, and he'll do it. Pinto Extreme easily taking round two of burnout. Three. Whoops for Kaizen. Coming into the thoroughfare. Taking his time, not wanting to use the boost just yet, or perhaps at all. No spectacular scores at all. Some initial impact. Bonus numbers yeah! picking up. Good there damage go. thus far. Multiplier really picks up as the rest of the cars slide on in there, Lee. We're closing in on about $2 million. There it is, damage at $1.8 million. It looks like Endrick up for the last minute men. Approaching on the shoulder, hitting the back of the van, and sends a van into oncoming traffic. His car is still spinning out, Lee. And it appeared as if he had a pretty good chance of inflicting some incredible damage oh, no. by Unfortunately, oh, I don't think it's going to get there, Kevin. You're right, Lee. And Woobs will take the round. Four. And our fourth and final round pits Ringworm for the Red Team Kaizen. Using his boost at the last moment to gain a little extra speed as he slams into the side of that bus, spinning out into the middle of the lanes. This could help him as this semi-truck rolls slowly on in. But unfortunately for him, he spun himself away from the other vehicles. Very low score for Ringworm. This will be Last Minute Men's chance to tie it up, Lee. Sandwich, he steps behind the wheel. Choosing to split the lanes for a moment as he sends a taxi into a van. And unfortunately for him, that taxi clipped the stoplight and did not fly into oncoming traffic. He does not get that last minute flourish of foreigners slamming into the accident. Ringworm takes the round, and the red team Kaizen takes yeah. burnout two. Uh, call it experience or call it dumb luck. Kaizen takes burnout two. That's right, Lee. Poor performances all around. I think a busted headlight was all that gave Kaizen the win on this one. And one person who did not even that great, but he did decent, True. was Woobs, who's with Stacy right now. Yes, Lee, I am here with Woobs, and you heard Lee, not the highest scoring round in arena history, but you managed to win. How are you feeling about the level of competition? Real confident with these guys. Uh, doesn't look like they know what they're doing. That's it. A little bit of smack talking. So tell me exactly how are you going to make this a three-peat today? We're just not going to lose to them one time. Just going to win all day. 
It's all about victory down here. Leave back to you. I wouldn't be counting your chickens there yet, Mr. Woobs, because you and your buddies of Team Kaizen took the console around only because you were less bad in the last minute, men. But let's just hope that the action is more exciting as we move on to Unreal Tournament 2003. And later, we've got America's Army Special Forces using Atlanta Cyberspace's VR pods. That's all coming up. Where else? Right here on Arena. That's it. Lip, lip to the right. Oh. Oops. Mim, is Final Fantasy in your used game section? Used games? You really do like fantasy, don't you? Toy stores don't take games seriously. You gotta talk to gamers. Final Fantasy breaks the role-playing mold, and you can save some cash if you buy it pre-owned. Cool. Pre-owned games and equipment at big discounts. Save on new games by trading in old ones. Try them before you buy them. If you're serious about games, talk to the gamers at EB Games. Hi, my name is Laurent Dobas, and I hold the Shelf Mode record for the Elysium Alps course on SSX. It took me only nine months to achieve this score. Four friends of mine, also in their 30s, purchased the system and the game so they could play too. When the PS2 came around, my life changed. The first SSX was a revelation for me. Awesome graphics on what video games are supposed to be all about. Once I realized the million points barrier could be broken, I had to keep trying. I had to do it. It was a hot summer afternoon and I was just out of the shower. I turned on my PS2, my VCR, and bang, I hit the million points on my first run. I was shaking like crazy and unable to play after that for a couple of hours. It was pretty insane. Welcome back to Arena, everyone. Now, before the break, Kaizen banged out an ugly win in Burnout 2. Let's see if they can find their mojo in time for Unreal Tournament 2003 as we go to Kevin to get things going. Kevin. Thank you very much, Lee. Yes, the game is Unreal Tournament 2003, and the mode is Capture the Flag. Today's map is Avarice. It's a desert wasteland that once stood as the crown jewel of a mighty empire, and now this abandoned shell of its former self acts like the final resting point for those warriors vanquished in the tournament. Let's get to the action and see who'll be left in the dust. One. And Unreal Tournament 2003 is underway. The last minute men have their work cut out for them, Kevin. That's right, Lee. In just a few moments, we'll see if they're really going to be stinking up the joint. And a member of Team Kaizen drawing first blood here early in round one as Eska, true to his form, making his way into the enemy base. Dude, where's our flag? Eska in control of the flag, trying to find his way out of the base and gets dropped as Endrick for Team Last Minutemen takes him down. Franklin, oh well, yeah, dude. A lot of talking going on over there from Team Minutemen. However, no offensive performance at all so far. All right, I'm going out ahead. Pinto Extreme is trying to prove you wrong. We saw Mac for Kaizen in our last show perform exceptionally well in this game. That's right, Lee, but you notice there's a slight strategy strategy switch up here as they leave Mac home to defend the flag. Eska sneaks into the base, picks up the flag, rocket launcher in hand, makes his way out the right-hand side, Pinto Extreme for Team Last Minute Men, also in possession of the flag. He goes down, which leaves Eska for Kaizen. He took it, I was alone. And Eska, he's outside now, spinning around using the shield gun, trying to avoid taking max damage from that member of Team Last Minute Men. Uh, oh, Eska goes down, and Last Minute Men is I able to return to the flag. Good Some defense help. early from Last Minute Men. No, I need you to be on the offense. All right, who's defending? You two, go out. Franklin and I are defending. I think Last Minute Men is still reeling from that loss they took. It was ugly. Eska can grab the flag for Kaizen. He also grabs some adrenaline as he makes his way out of the base, running into a member of Team last minute. Don't let him take you out. Jumping, strafing, and dodging. As he's able to avoid that lightning gun fire, he is outside now. You need help? Nah. 
You got it? Should have it. We're getting precariously close to our favorite overtime. Got that thing, dude. Eska grabs some health and drops in on his own flag, planting one for Team Kaizen. One to nothing here. And Eska wasting no time lead, turning right around, grabbing a shield power up. And if history is our guide with Kaizen, one may be enough. Dude, they got nothing. They're not even coming into our base. No and Eska on cue grabs the flag, and that's it. Two. And round two is underway. Team Kaizen continuing this reign of terror here. Sandwichi left home to bake some brownies and camp the flag. That double damage power up and lightning gun in hand as Mac for Kaizen does the same. Hey, you guys got it at the base? I'm gonna go, I got yeah. double. We watch Mac navigate around the map. Last time we saw him, he was fantastic. But so far in round one, he was pretty much non-existent. Let's see if he could pick up his game here in round two. Sandwichi defending the flag with a lightning gun. And to be honest, I don't believe that's the best strategy. Generally, when left to defend a flag, I would say go for rockets or some sort of weapon with splash damage. That way you can catch your enemy, even if you do happen to miss him. I'm in there, base. If Kaizen's looking for Mac to pick it up, Last Minute Man is looking for anyone to pick it up. Good job. Pinto Extreme hoping to change up the pace here. He's in the enemy base, Lee. Taking fire from all angles. There's three of them here. He goes down without even touching the flag. Nice attempt, Blanco Nino. Too bad your ass got sad. Well, we're more than halfway here into round two. And if Last Minute Man wants any chance for having lost the console game, they better start thinking about a little bit more offense. Well, clearly between rounds, Lee, they switched up their strategy as we see Pinto Extreme and Silent Knight both heading out for the flag. And there's Mac for Kaizen. Dude, I got it. There he went, Mac for Kaizen. And Pinto Extreme trying to even it up, grabs the flag, but gets taken out. And once again, a defensive battle for the first half of the round, a late score by Team Kaizen. And Eska grabs the flag one more time, as much to prevent the opponent from scoring, although he's taken out quickly. Get the flag back. Unless Mass Minute Men musters up something here with time running down. Well, that's exactly what they've got, Lee. They've got the last minute to make something happen. I'm running, I'm running. And Pinto Extreme tries to do just that, flag in hand. Oh, there's no way I'm going to make this. Teammates cheering him on. You better hurry. As time ticks oh, away God. here late in round two of Unreal Tournament. Oh, my God. I had it. I had it. Be late, be left. Three. And round three is underway. It's all academic in terms of Unreal Tournament 2003 and who will win it. But Kevin, the all-important MVP points, still well in play. How about I get a couple well, caps so I can get MVP Army. points? A lot of D so far. And Mac for Kaizen on D as Endrick makes his way into the base. He doesn't make it far, though, as he gets dropped. Mac for Kaizen. With the flag on cue yet again, Lee. I think he realized he had a chance to speak with our lovely Stacey Barcelona. If I get this one cap, I can, I know. I'm going to score it just for her. And Mac for Kaizen. The blood rushing out of his brain has a little navigational error. I can't find our base. As Endrick for Team Minuteman taken out. Damn. There it is. The Mac Daddy stakes his claim. That secures the interview right there. And there's Woobs for Kaizen, still on D. Ringworm doing the same, and Silent Knight for Minuteman, trying to put some points on the board. Oh, that was too easy. Too easy. Mac grabs the flag. One last chance to score, perhaps. Also means one less chance for Sandwichi and the Minutemen to score. Mac places the flag. Hendrik, you suck. Yeah, well, I keep killing my own teammates. What can I do? Woobs wants in on that action as he grabs the flag. Switching it up, making his way back to base now is Ringworm for Kaizen. Tangles with a member of last minute. And if Woob scores here, Kevin, I don't know who we're going to send over to Stacy. Dude, if you score, are you jerks? And down yeah. he goes. Thanks for helping me out. Crushing his hopes. You're all about the interview, aren't you, man? <laughs> I'm all about the interview. Moments tick it away as I nod off. Endrick was able to make it into the base. And if he makes it back, he could be pulling for some MVP points. But too little, too late. And Kevin, there was a time when we talked about Kaizen as a challenger. They're just toying with the last minute men. That's right, Lee. It wasn't even about points for their team. They were just all competing for a little alone time with Stacy. Well, Mac's going to get a little bit of that with Stacy right now. Stacy. Thanks, Lee. I am getting pretty used to talking to Mac over here, who's pretty happy with your performance in UT 2003. I'm pretty happy. I felt like we really dominated them. They didn't have a chance. You know, they were pretty upset while you guys were playing. Were you purposely trying to get a rise out of them? When you lose, you get upset, and they lost pretty bad. They did lose pretty bad. We'll see how they do in America's Army. Lee, back to you. Stacey, I'm not even going to say it. Kaizen's dominance was apparent early, and the game was academic as the last minute men were taken to school in UT 2003. Oh, but we're far from done. We'll see how things play out in America's Army Special Forces, which we will play on the VR pods from Atlantis Cyberspace. That's all coming up, and it's right here on Arena. I'm Lawrence Fishburne. You're watching G4 for Gamers. How much are you paying for internet service? $21? 
Aren't you being charged too much? We think so. With PeoplePC Online, you get unlimited internet access for only $10.95 a month. Go to peoplepc.com now to try us free for 30 days and compare us with your current ISP. With PeoplePC Online, you get internet service for less than half of what the big guys cost. And that's just the beginning. You also get more local access numbers than AOL, plus a smart dialer that automatically chooses the fastest, most reliable number. So you always get the best connection. All for just $10.95 a month. Try PeoplePC Online free for 30 days and see for yourself. Go to peoplepc.com for a quick three-minute download of our easy-to-use software. Or call 1-800-748-7986. PeoplePC Online, a better way to internet. Welcome back, everyone, to Arena. Now, before the break, Kaizen cleaned the last-minute men's clock in UT 2003. But let's see what happens as we strap into Atlanta Cyberspace's VR pods for America's Army Special Forces. Right now, let's go to Sergeant Hansen for the briefing on today's mission. Good evening, gentlemen. I'm Sergeant First Class Hansen, and this is your brief for the rescue mission. Enemy conducted an ambush this morning. They injured one of the key leaders of the resistance. That resistance leader was able to escape and went to a neutral hospital in between enemy and friendly lines in order to get treatment. Your mission is to infill into this area, proceed to the hospital where you can enter through the lower or upper levels or through the garage and make contact with the resistance leader. You are then to escort him out of the building through the helipad where you'll be exfilled. You must ensure that you do not injure any civilians or any staff in the hospital. Are there any questions? No, no sir. sir. Good luck. All right, I'm here in the VR Command Center where Team Kaizen was chosen to go first, and the team is suiting up right now. Once these virtual soldiers are ready, they'll have 10 minutes to complete the mission, and then the last minute men will step in. Now, our players will be immersed in the ultra-realistic environment of America's Army Special Forces through the use of Atlantis Cyberspace's virtual reality pod. Well, it looks like Team Kaizen is locked and loaded, so let's see how they do. And Kaizen is up first, our reigning champions with Eska as their captain. All right, I'm gonna go in this room real quick and try and check it out. Almost nonchalantly calling out their orders. This is where we got put down last time with the lag, watch yeah. out. And look at how smoothly the returning champs transition from room to room, Lee. There's a guy like on the ground. And Max spots an enemy prone. Ringworm tries to take him out. I'm watching the rear. An excellent strategy on the part of Eska, notice him leaning out in the physical world, hey. causing his character to lean in the virtual world and give him some coverage and a better beat on his enemy. I can't yeah. see, I can't see, help me out. Good communication, asking for help. Shots are still ringing out, though, so they are unable to advance to the hospital until they eliminate the enemy threat. I hate how they pin us down right here. It's so lame. Mac and Woogs hold up behind those two pillars. Smoke grenade has been tossed. You guys, we got to get moving. But obvious urgency. Time is limited. A couple members of Team Kaizen taking a little battle damage, and they have yet to advance past right. these columns. Follow me on three. Ready? Yeah, I'll lay down cover. One, two, three. Move, right, move, move, move. An excellent strategy yet again. Communicating perfectly. One member of Kaizen laying down cover fire as the rest move out. And Woobs runs right in front of the rifle of Mac. Not quite sure if he took any damage there, but they've got to be more careful than that, Lee. In search of that VIP, usually by this point, Kevin, we've seen very few times where all four members of any unit are this far along. Don't get me wrong, Lee. I'd love to be making fun of these losers, but they're performing excellently. No, that's VIP. And the VIP has been found. Will one of these guys please make a mistake? Wait for the smoke to clear. Momentary confusion. I don't know. Which way? I think we need a U-turn. And they are running short on time here, Lee, as they try to escort the VIP to that helipad. All four members of the unit still healthy and contributing. And they are bunched up, so any rifle fire here could result in a team kill, Lee. They're going to have to be extra careful. And there it is. Two members of Team Kaizen taken out late. They were doing so well, Lee. I'm not quite sure what happened there. They got bunched up for a moment. And I think in the confusion of the enemy fire, they were just not able to get a beat on the member of the opposing Ray force. Ringworm and Eska still moving with the VIP. And Eska goes down. Notice to the left-hand side of Ringworm, he's opening up fire and he's completely ignoring the enemy. He did not scan the sector before he walked up the stairs. Finally, Ringworm takes out that member of the opposing force who was able to eliminate almost his entire team. And it's all Ringworm as he escorts this VIP safely into the hangar. Excellent teamwork right up until the final moments of the round, Lee. And Kevin, Team Kaizen, they did achieve their objective. 
but at a heavy cost. Absolutely rightly. Textbook performance until the very end where they got bunched up outside that hospital. And now it's Last Minute Men's Last Chance. And the Last Minute Men have their last chance to not become the Last Minute Meatballs. Bro, we're taking positions. Led by Captain Silent Knight. Enemy, enemy. Where? 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 Location. And right off the bat, decent communication for the newcomers here. He's at the truck. He's at the truck. He's running. We've heard more chatter out of the Last Minute Men in this first two minutes of this round than we had the whole previous 20 minutes of the show. And Sandwichi leaning out, peeking from behind those pillars taking a pot shot in the general direction of a member of the opposing force. All right, let's move to the hospital. Silent Knight likes to feel that grenade launcher against his shoulder, because I don't know where the heck he's going to use it in that hallway. Right, you are, Lee. In fact, I'm confused as to why we're even seeing Silent Knight in that hallway. It's the rest of his team who's down by the hospital, and Silent Knight is finally playing catch up. Shot, we shot, we shot. Where did it come from? The roof, the roof. The roof, the roof. There's fire. Pinto Extreme opening up fire. Not quite sure he's exactly gone, he's what gone. he's trying to take All out. Right, let's clear the lobby. Well, and it was dangerously close to his teammate, Silent Knight, there. I don't know why he was shooting in that direction so haphazardly. We saw what happened to two people too close together last time. Exactly. That exact same scenario happened to Team Kaizen. They've now entered that hospital. And at a disadvantage, they have not acclimated themselves to the layout of this building. Endrick and Sandwichi staying back to cover the front as Pinto Extreme and Silent Knight move out in tandem, trying to find that VIP. And Sandwichi runs from around the corner, finds a member of the opposing force. Smart move as he strays back for cover behind that wall and reloads his weapon. Oh, and Sandwichi spots some enemy fire. Who's dead? And Sandwichi apparently has killed all three of his teammates. First words out of the VIP's mouth, Lee. I thought there were four of you. Okay, Sandwichi, meet me at the exit. And actually, Endrick is still alive. It was Pinto Extreme and Silent Night that were taken out. Sandwichi is outside the hospital covering the front doors as Endrick snakes the VIP out. Decent strategy for the two-man crew here. As shots ring out, Sandwichi has a beat on him, and he takes down a member of the opposing force. Sandwichi going prone behind some barrels. <laughs> Unfortunately, Sandwichi was covering the wrong place at the wrong time, and Endrick gets taken out from behind, and the VIP crouches behind a set of boxes to piss himself as he knows he's not in good hands here. The VIP and Sandwichi making their way into that safe zone. Just like Team Kaizen, one member left for last minute, man, and that's all they're going going to need to bring that VIP to safety. And Kevin, the rare team kill suicide combo was fatal for the last minute, man, as the penalty cost them, even though they did save the VIP. That's right, Lee, and Kaizen was on a roll until they lost three men late in the mission, but Ringworm led the VIP to safety, and Kaizen won the round. Earlier, our teams duked it out at Unreal Tournament 2003, but Kaizen was once again on a roll and unstoppable. And with a win in Burnout 2, Kaizen completes its second consecutive sweep of all three games, and with a bonus for overall high score, they win the match. So the only thing left is the MVP, and based on his Razor Sharp Precision in America's Army Special Forces and his good, or was it bad, driving a burnout too. It's Wombs of Team Kaizen. And Wombs. Thanks, Lee. Congratulations, MVP, and clenching the victory for your team. How'd you do it? I think teamwork's what paid off. We kind of strategized before the, the game what we're going to do, and we did it, and it really paid off well for us. It did. Any advice for the team who tries to compete against you guys next? Don't try too hard. You're just going to get hurt. Ouch. Well, that's going to do it from here. We'll look forward to their next time on Arena and see if they can go for four in a row. Lee, back to you. It's going to get hurt, are they? Woo! I'm excited for the next episode because there was never really any doubt in this one as the last minute men couldn't stop Team Kaizen. They could only hope to contain them. But you know what? They couldn't do that either. So Team Kaizen lives to see another day. Until next time, for Kevin Pereira and Stacey Barcelona, I'm Lee Raven. We'll see you here next time on Arena. Well, now that you've seen the competition, we want to see if you've got the stuff of champions. So if you're at least 18 years of age and live in or near the Los Angeles area, then throw your hat into the ring by going to our website. Visit us at g4tv.com slash arena and sign up to compete on the show that turns multiplayer video games into a competitive sport. And we will see you in the arena.
My name is Dave Kramer, and I'm the world record holder for fastest completion of parking challenge number five in 18 wheeler. It took me months of daily playing to whittle my time down. On my days off, while my wife and son were sleeping, I poured eight plus hours of non-stop gameplay. For some reason, I picked up this game very quickly. I mean, I'm usually pretty good at driving and racing games, but there was something about this. I guess it was that it was just unique. My favorite movie is a no-brainer, Star Wars. I'm a huge Star Wars fan and have been ever since I saw episode four back in 77. I basically play games because it's kind of an escape. The same reason a lot of people read books or watch movies. The way I explain it best to those who don't like games is this. You watch movies, right? What could possibly be better than watching a movie and getting to be the lead? You can control the outcome. And you can try things in games you never could get away with in real life because it might cause some harm. Wow! Awesome record! You must be a pro! New record! Today on X-Play, hello nurse, it's our racing evolution. Inappropriate use of a shiv in the suffering. An anime porn of the highest quality in Sexy Beach 2. <laughs> Get ready to pander to the lowest common denominator. It's game time. The fact that no one understands them doesn't make them artists. It's Adam Sessler and Morgan Webb. So what does it make us? Confusing. Hello and welcome to X-Play, the show where we give the people what they want at least 2% of the time. And what the people want, judging by our message boards, are sex and violence. So today we grant your wish, you joystick twiddling Caligulas. <laughs> the violence comes in the form of a survival horror game set in a haunted prison. Because regular prison isn't scary enough. Oh. And then there's the sex. Thankfully it's not in the prison game. Yes, thankfully. Later in the show, we take an in-depth look at one of Japan's top anime porn games. And for those with less purian interest, we have a Magic the Gathering game. It's an expansion pack for Dark Age of Camelot. But we kick things off with our review of Our Racing Evolution, a title for people who like a little sex in their racing. Well, that just sounds dangerous. Not very satisfying either. The sound of roaring engines. The smell of burning rubber. This must be a racing title. Oh, goody, it is. Pop culture tells us beautiful women in fast cars are a perfect match. Even though I have no direct experience with either, I can tell you our racing evolution cashes in on this combo. I feel sorry for the other racers. They'll take on the role of Rena, an ambulance driver turned race car driver. Just because she can drive an ambulance, this means she's a great race car driver? Oh, hello. A trip to the ER never looked so good. I wonder who the developer was targeting here. Could it be male adolescents? <laughs> Someone, please tell me, who are these women? The name's Rena. Our racing evolution comes from the same folks who made the arcade-friendly Ridge Racer. Don't get confused, though. Our racing evolution isn't the next Ridge Racer game. If you have strong opinions on how a racer should play, you may find that this game does not quite meet your expectations. First, the cars handle like my grandma's Studebaker. Looks like whales are special. They corner like whales. And with the default auto braking system, it's like driving with your parking brake on. My advice, turn auto braking off right away. The game comes up short with only 11 tracks to race in the racing life mode. The graphics are so-so in comparison with other racers like Project Gotham Racing or Need for Speed Underground. But if you love average graphics, you're in luck! It's normal for your pit crew and crew chief to help you out when racing, right? Wrong! In this game, the incessant chatter can make it hard to concentrate on the road. Get off the brake! It's a green light, kid! Where's my mechanic? Just what I want to say. Make up for your mistakes. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, sure, chief. Whatever. On the positive side, you'll find a nice mix of car years and models. Despite only having 11 tracks, the game offers other modes to play, like drag race, rally racing. Don't forget the ladies. Our racing evolution walks the line between the simulation and an arcade-style racer. 
Car upgrade options on the sim side and features such as auto braking make it accessible like an arcade racer. The developers did try something that sets them apart from the rest of the pack. You can really put the pressure on by riding in your opponent's slipstream. You'll not only gain a bit of speed, you'll also fill up your opponent's pressure meter. When filled, this meter will trigger the nerve-wracked driver into making errors, often causing them to spin out of control and choke down a healthy serving of your exhaust. If you're looking for the ultimate racing experience, you'll need to look elsewhere. Our racing evolution is in the fast lane, but stuck in neutral for a three out of five. So the game isn't stellar, but while the PS2 has Gran Turismo 3 and the Xbox has Project Gotham Racing 2, GameCube owners may want to pick up our racing because it's the only racing sim currently available for that console. And now Sorry. we turn to violence. Midway used to be the arcade king with games like Spy Hunter, Joust, Gauntlet, but in recent years they've turned their focus to the console. Yes, and with that came a dramatic shift in the tone of their games. Last year they came out with Roadkill, an ultra-violent, expletive-laden Grand Theft Auto clone. Now they're taking that attitude to the survival horror genre, and the results, while gory, are surprisingly good. Here's our preview of the very mature-rated The Suffering. After spending some hard time in solitary confinement with Midway's upcoming horror shooter, The Suffering, we can now tell you what life is like on the other side. This kid's too. You got to get me out of here! It's really, really painful. Things are pretty bad for Torque. Not only did his parents name him after a wrench, he's sitting on death row, convicted of killing his wife and kid. There's beauty in you. I can always see it. Did he do it? The scary thing is he can't even remember. You gotta get out of this sh before it collapses. It's in here! That's Morse code for, we're f***ing. When an earthquake rocks the state pen, Mutilated freak monsters run loose, jamming their sharp extremities into people. Aspirin, please! You start out with a simple shiv, lovingly handcrafted by one of Torque's fellow inmates. Before long, you're able to pick up firearms from recently departed corrections officers. The cool thing is that you can switch from third to first person whenever you choose. There are 12 unique monsters, each inspired by a different method of execution. Here's our old buddy, Beheaded. Not to be outdone by your pal and ours, Firing Squad. With these creatures on the prowl, the last thing you're worried about is dropping the soap. are what make this game spooky. Flipping various switches provides a wide variety of scares. Torque's t-shirt gets bloodier the more you play and he has occasional flashbacks and premonitions that are disturbing. Daddy, I can't see. No, I don't want to see it, no! Also count on the occasional cheap scare. And not so cheap. Every time you witness horrific events, your insanity gauge is kicked up a notch. When it's full, Tort can transform into a room-clearing monstrosity. Best of all, the ending is altered depending on your actions. Like a repeat offender who just can't change his ways, we'll be back in jail in a few months to give you the final verdict. Until then, there is no escape. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Now, we really dislike that game Roadkill, which seemed to be trying way too hard to be shocking. Right, well, in the suffering, on the other hand, the gore and profanity kind of, they added to the nightmare's atmosphere. And we'll let you know our final verdict when this one comes out later this year. And if you can't wait that long for a fix of prison-based survival horror, why not rent the classic prison film Midnight Express? It's set in Turkey. Ooh. Hi, I'm 
everybody, party at Dwayne's Castle. It's Dark Age of Camelot, Trials of Atlantis. Coming soon to a rehab clinic near you, it's Adam Sessler and Morgan Webb. Welcome back to X-Play, the show where we always look forward to saying massively multiplayer online role-playing game, because you know, it just trips off the tongue. It's the worst, I hate that term. I mean, can we come up with something better, like SLS for Social Life Simulator? Mm. Ooh, E-W-E, escapism with elves. How about RFWTS? What's that? Renaissance Festival without the smell. Oh, I like that one. Okay, Dark Age of Camelot was an MMORPG that came out in 2001. People liked it, but felt it was a little short on content. So the developers released an expansion pack, Shrouded Isles. And now, there's a second expansion pack, yay! Except to play it, you have to be a high-level character or else you are screwed. Yes, plus a lot of it takes place underwater, so you have a lot of soggy level 40 characters running around. And no one wants to see a half-orc in a clinging tunic. Oh, speak for yourself. Here's a review of Dark Age of Camelot, Trials of Atlantis for the PC. No, this isn't really an update to Battle Chess, but it is a chess game. It's just one of the many trials that await online gamers in the Dark Age of Camelot's expansion pack, The Trials of Atlantis. So, with so many massively multiplayer online games available, only a few titles have been able to separate themselves from the rest of the pack. What you need is a sizable player community that enjoys delving into the game day in and day out. To that end, Dark Age of Camelot's new expansion wants to lure people back into the proverbial fold, with a chance to undertake the nine challenging trials of Atlantis. The Atlanteans are coming! The Atlanteans are coming! Expanding upon the scope of their mythology with the addition of areas based on ancient Egypt and ancient Greece, Trials of Atlantis also kicks down three new starting races. Sinister Shars, a Frostolf, whatever that is, and these oafish half-ogres. That's right, newcomers can begin as fresh heroes and whack the hell out of low-level snakes and lizards. Whoopee. But if you already have a high-level character, you may be better off sticking to what you've got since frankly, nearly all of the new content is strictly for level 40 players and up. But soft, a battle from yonder clearing breaks. Exit stage lefteth. Anyway, the new game centers around the wisdom of the lost city of Atlantis, and it's your job to group up with other adventurers and seek out this forgotten knowledge. Along the way, there will be plenty of new creature types to smack around. Yikes, where's the friggin' orchid man when you need him? And, well, perhaps it's appropriate to point out that some enemies will be much friskier than others. If you do decide to hop in a boat and brave the trials, you'll find that each realm has its own perils. In fact, if we dive just below the surface of the new adventure, we find that a significant portion of the new game takes place underwater. However, it's fair to say that traversing the sea's wondrous depths is, in many ways, more of a treat than a chore. All right, while the new content in Trials of Atlantis makes for a sizable addition to the Dark Age of Camelot, the expansion has its share of problems. Yep, sadly, it's not the best game ever. Still, Dark Age is easily one of the best massively multiplayer online RPGs available today, and Trials of Atlantis is a solid addition to the overall experience. We give it a just good enough 3 out of 5. Just good enough. How many times have I heard that? <laughs> Keep in mind that you have to have the original Dark Age of Camelot game plus the other expansion pack to play Trials of Atlantis, which can get kind of expensive. Right, but the chances are anyone interested in this game already picked up the original. Oh, they, maybe they just like leveling up by killing small woodland creatures. You know, kind of like Ted Nugent. Hi, Ted. Up next, do you believe in magic? I thank you for releasing me. No? How about Magic the Gathering then? With 0% down payment, it's Adam Sessler and Morgan Webb. I don't want the die tech guy to show up. He's kind of freaky. Welcome back to X-Play. We have a strategy game based on a card game. Now, normally this is a recipe for disaster, like the Yu-Gi-Oh games from Pokemon Stadium. Yes, but this is based on Magic the Gathering card game, so at least it doesn't have Pikachu. Instead, it has Attack Bird. Ooh! Here's our review of Magic the Gathering Battlegrounds. Attack pig? 
I am blessed by the heavens. How can you win? There is no way for you to defeat me. In Magic the Gathering Battlegrounds, the somewhat nerdy card game has been replaced by somewhat nerdy real-time combat. For the uninitiated, Magic the Gathering involves dueling wizards. It's a winner-takes-all scenario where each sorcerer can summon up an assortment of creatures, and every second counts. Defiant Elf. Raging Goblin. Actually, it's very nerdy. Once a match starts, it's basically a race to collect mana, the stuff that powers your spells. And then you'll want to spend your stash summoning monsters to maim your opponent. Uh, yeah, and that's about it. Suntail Hawk. Suntail Hawk. The spells themselves vary between summoning creatures to fight on your behalf and enchantments that can fortify your existing armies. Run wild. Carnal Phage. For example, let's say your opponent summons up the King of Pop. Wait, I don't really want to go there right now. I am defeated. Let's say your opponent conjures himself Saddam. You could summon up your own dictator like Fidel Castro to cancel him out. Getting to get the picture? Does my destiny end here? So beyond the basics, there's a one-player quest peppered with arbitrary plot points. I thank you for releasing me. Yep, so that's that. And, uh, oh, you can also customize your own spellbook. Lefty. And finally, you can take your sorcerers online. This aspect of the game is probably the most fun. In all, what you see is what you get. The game's not unfun, it's just sort of bland. We can only afford Magic the Gathering Battlegrounds, a middle of the road, three out of five. Avatar of Might, Venerable Monk. Oh, I could just conjure all day long. Stick around, when we come back, we have sex. No, no, on the show. No, no, oh, God. Coming up. Yes, we're stooping to this. <laughs> it's Sexy Beach 2. It's 11 p.m. Do you know where your Adam Sessler and Morgan Webb are? Hint, we're right here. Yeah, that was weird. Welcome back to X-Play. When Morgan and I went to Japan, we brought a lot of things back with us. Yeah, like those decorative memory cards and like camo and Hello Kitty. Well, I had a one-handed controller, which left my other hand free. Oh, that's nice. Well, I got a crippling addiction to pachinko. That's great. Well, you know, we also brought back anime porn. Lots and lots of anime porn. For professional reasons, of course. Okay, but mostly these games use 2D images to tell their sordid little stories, or so Adam tells me. But one of the few porn games out there to use polygons is Sexy Beach 2. And it makes the girls at Outlaw Beach Volleyball look like nuns. Here's the first installment in our new series that examines the steamier side of gaming. We like to call it games that make you feel funny. Warning, the following review has been shown to cause feelings of funniness in adult males. The level of funniness will be measured in X-Play's patented five-point scale. What happens when you take DOA Beach Volleyball and remove all the boring volleyball-related parts? You get the pure intellectual stimulation of Sexy Beach 2. The premise of Sexy Beach 2 is simple. Your mission is to go on a series of dates with a scantily clad virtual woman. Your ultimate goal is a night of hot, sweaty... First, your dates involve such fascinating activities as watching the girl read a book, watching the girl sit at a table, and the ever popular watching the girl sleep. Sexy Beach 2 is only available in the original Japanese. Gamers not fluent in the language might have a tough time understanding the seductive banter. Luckily, my extensive experience at the Tokyo Game Show prepared me for moments like these. No thanks, I already had breakfast. The happier you make your virtual girlfriend, the more swimsuits you'll get to dress her up in. Hmm, can't show that on TV or these. Okay, fine. Swimsuit choice is key. You want to make sure you pick one that will look good strewn on the floor while you have... As you get to know your conquest to be better, the dates get a little more interactive. After a few days of stalking, um, watching her, 
You get to touch her, giving her back rubs and affectionate thigh massages. Ooh, she's a ticklish one, isn't she? Eventually, your girl will take you to her favorite hideaway on the island and engage in activities that are in no way suggestive. What? She's just sitting in a tree with a banana-shaped boat in the background? Don't read too much into it. And once you've sat through enough pool swimming, jump roping, ball bouncing, and weird monkey critter snuggling to confuse even the most healthy libido, you are finally rewarded with a romantic night of... But Sexy Beach 2 is not just about a pathetic virtual substitute for real human interaction. Uh, I don't think it's uh, kind of it. What? Oh. Okay, it is all about a pathetic virtual substitute. Whatever the case, it's making me feel a little funny. Well, <laughs> thanks. That was a really rewarding experience. You know, I'm kind of over this. You can have your little boy show. Ah, Bills. Hey, Morgan, Morgan, wait! Gotta, gotta, I always have to do the viewer mail by myself. Oh, hey, yeah. All right, today's email is from Lisa in Michigan. Lisa writes, I belong to the small but growing class of the hardcore gamer girls. I wonder if you can do a show dedicated to gamer girls or just do a gaming from a woman's standpoint. Well, Lisa, that does sound like a great idea. And as soon as I finish playing Sexy Beach 2 in its entirety for the third time, it's got to find all the nuances in Lisa, it. Lisa, Lisa, let me put it this way. Being a girl gamer can be an exercise in cultural masochism, as the gravity-defying breast physics of Sexy Beach 2 demonstrate. The gaming world doesn't present the most accurate picture of either women or men. Or zombies. The Resident Evil zombies strike me as a little over the top, you know. They play to all those zombie stereotypes. The groaning, the bringing, My the shuffling, the point, moving. Lisa, is that someday, maybe not now, maybe not even next year, but sometime, our day will come. And until then, we have this. What? <laughs> oh, no! Make that stop! <laughs> Make that stop! Oh! <laughs> Play. You can download Naked Riden there. Or you can see more of Sexy Beach 2. Or, or Naked Riden. He does cartwheels and stuff. Two. And then Sexy he gets Beach next two to the guy. With the jiggle and, then he, like, and, the, and the shake on the ground, and the jiggle. And he does like cartwheels and stuff. Really? <laughs> Go to website there. Well, let us know what you think of either Naked What's His Face or Sexy Beach 2 by coming to our message boards, which are at our website, along with all the reviews for the Game Design Today show. Yes. Yeah, they're all there. They are all there. That's techtv.com slash xplay. Download Nick and Ryden. Uh, justify. Just don't send it to me. All right, sexy beach. <laughs> oh, Hot top. Good night. <laughs>is the latest installment of the game franchise to introduce Pierce Brosnan as everyone's favorite English spy. Drop your weapon. Who are you? <gasps> Bond. James Bond. Q returns to give parental advice to the juvenile agent who only has one thing on his mind. I don't believe I've had the pleasure. And you won't if I have any say in the matter. Also lending their vocal talents to the game are Willem Dafoe. Then we unleash our little nanobots on the world. And Heidi Klum is Dr. Nadonova. And of course... Jaws.
Shannon Elizabeth also lends her unique talents to the game as one of the legendary Bond girls. And Maya opens up the game with her soundtrack to James Bond rivaling even some of the classic live action films, making Everything or Nothing the most star studded 007 game ever made. Not your ordinary third person shooter game, Everything or Nothing emphasizes the importance of being a real spy to uncover the secrets of the nanobots. I'm disappointed. I thought we were going to have dinner in London. Stealth your way through missions as you hide behind walls and crouch behind large objects to take down the enemies. And learn to use your bond sense in crucial areas in the game to locate items to complete each objective. Begin your missions by taking part in the training exercise. Here you'll learn to fight hand to hand and to use the repel gun to climb up the sides of walls. But what's a bond game without the cool gadgets? Pay attention, 007. Q has invented small robotic spiders to aid you in your missions. Use them to navigate through tight crawl spaces and to destroy junction boxes that may impede your path. There's also three different types of grenades in Bond's arsenal to use in crucial situations. There's a frag grenade, strobe grenade, and the EMP grenade to take out any electrical device. Q has also updated MI6's motor pool by importing the Porsche Cayenne, Aston Martin Vanquish, and the Triumph Daytona 600 motorcycle into the game. But put both hands on the wheel because the developers have introduced a real engine under the hood. The car will slide and turn like a real car, so watch out for pedestrians and trees. Precision driving is a must in this game, but remember you always have rockets to fall back on. There's also some fun Easter eggs to uncover in every level called Bond Moments. These capture the action and charm of this gentleman spy's signature moments from the Bond movies. So if you see a damsel in distress, or underdressed, go say hello and get some extra points. We've learned a few new tricks, haven't we? Could you be a dear and get me a drink, please? James Bond Everything or Nothing has more secrets and weapons to uncover. My nanotech weapons destroy all metal they touch, and it appears the only weapon you have left is sarcasm. But before Bond pulls off his Kill best it. Houdini impersonation, coming up, we're answering your viewer request for 007, and we'll uncover the platinum unlockable cheats. Goodbye, James. Remember, what we show you is for your eyes only. <laughs> I just got... <laughs> Later on the show, we're also going to show you through some of the toughest levels in Everything or Nothing. And show you how to earn a platinum ranking for some key missions. Why you got to be hateful? Uh, I didn't think I was being hateful. I was, I was pretty angry. No, I just think it was funny. Well, it was Bond reference. We're doing a Bond show. I'm sorry. You should have... Yeah. You should have got Laura. I'll get over here. She's overrated. Well... Think about what you've done. All right, now we're about to show you some of the best Bond moments in Everything or Nothing coming up right now. Oh, nice little reference from my show. Well, I thought. I'm gonna go eat. <laughs> 007 Everything or Nothing explodes onto your screen with all the action of a Hollywood movie. What sets James Bond apart from other spies is, when completing a mission, he does it with finesse and superior skill. These are known as Bond moments. Completing these moments will help you find hidden items, mission shortcuts, and subduing your enemies in style. Not to mention increasing your score to earn gold mission rewards. In mission a long way down, Bond must repel down the nanotech facility. On the first level, look up to the left for a repel point, where you'll find the Dragunov sniper rifle, completing the first Bond moment. Repel down and go left through the tunnel. Open the steam valve to stun your enemies and make short work of them for the second moment. Repel down to the next level, and inside, flip the table for cover and drop the enemies to the window for the third. Repel to the third level, and open another steam valve to stun your enemies for the fourth. Once you've shut off the flames, go inside and use your bond sense to target the weak ceiling. Then shoot it down on top of your enemies for the final bond moment. In mission train chase, Bond must catch a train in his Porsche Cayenne Turbo. After the first long tunnel, look for the shortcut to the left. Follow this road and shoot down the helicopter for the first Bond moment. Ahead, as the temple collapses around you, jump the fallen columns for the second moment. Now let's catch that train. Look for a ramp between the giant foot ruins and jump the tracks for the final Bond moment. In Mission Mardi Gras Mayhem, Bond must rendezvous with NSA agent Starling and his Aston Martin V12 Vanquish. On your way to hijacking the van, 
turn right against these arrows and look for a shortcut ramp across the brick courtyard for the first bond moment. Load your vanquish in the back of the van for the second moment. Well done. Later, pursue the limo with this shortcut, jumping through the concrete pipe for the third. Then disable the limo using your acid slick for the final bond moment. <laughs> Emission Pontchartrain Bridge. Bond must stop Jaws's truck on his Triumph Daytona 600. Jump the gate for the first bond moment. Fork to the right and rocket the enemies on the front porch for the second moment. On the bridge, jump to the oncoming side over the construction ramps for the third. And finally, when the truck jackknifes, action slide underneath it for the final bond moment. These are just a glimpse at all the bond moments to be discovered in 007 Everything or Nothing. And the added points will help you earn gold to unlock the platinum objectives. We still got more bond goodies so you can shake a moonraker at. We'll show you strategies for cooperative play and cheats you can unlock by earning platinum ratings. And that's all coming up, only on Cheat. Come on. Cheat! Agent Rouse and Wood believes it's air deep undercover to give you the goods on 007, everything or nothing. But they are, in fact, under my control. Corey, <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> nothing. Look, there's no denying that some of the levels in the latest Bond game are hard enough to knock the living daylights out of you. But as luck would have it, we've got the solution to one of this game's toughest levels. <laughs> no. No. James Bond Everything or Nothing has incorporated all the finer points of Ian Fleming's character James Bond into an action-adventure espionage game. From the high-octane explosions to extreme car chases. And of course, what's a Bond movie without Bond women? We've received viewer requests from Hero of Winds, SpongeBoy 1985, and Bonzo So 21, who are having a hard time seeing the light in the Vertigo mission. Well, grab your GPS and night vision goggles, because Cheat's going undercover. Bond has been instructed to find 003's whereabouts on top of the mountain with the help of Serena. The first level of the mine is relatively easy. Take out the guards and repel to the second level. More guards will impede your path, so take them out one at a time and head towards the elevator to the right after clearing the area. Listen to M as she tells you more about the mission. Look for an old junction box. Head up the shaft and watch out for agents who'll spring down from the top. There'll be an armor vest to the left. If you don't need it, leave it there, because you'll need it when you come back down after finishing your secondary mission. Turn around and look up, and you'll see another shaft leading up to the next phase of the mission. There'll be another armor vest waiting for you when you reach the top. Again, leave it if you don't need it. Run to the right and look out for the rocket that'll be coming straight at you. Duck and take out the sniper. Push the minecart and continue running forward. When the mine splits, look to the left and aim high to take out an agent hiding in the rafters. The mine going down to the right will lead you to another armored vest where you'll have to equip your thermovision to see in the dark. When you head up the mine, take cover because there's two snipers looking to take off your head. Take out the agents in your immediate area first and then go after the snipers last. When you enter the junction box room, you'll be told the uplink device is missing. You must find that uplink device and install it so we can help you find 003. Follow the tracks to go up another level to look for the missing uplink device. The enemies have gotten smarter at this point because now they're wearing flak jackets. They're heavily armored, so aim for their heads or fight them hand to hand for the quickest results. When you reach the next level, shoot the guard in the middle first because he'll turn his table over for cover. Once you dispatch the agents in the room, use the armor vest to the right and take the uplink device. Head back down to the machine room to reconnect the uplink device and then take out the power antenna. Go back down to activate the shaft elevator where you first talked to M. But watch your back, because your area has been compromised and agents will be gunning for you. Mission complete. Upward and onward, 007. The elevator will now take you to the top of the mountain and on to your next assignment. Welcome back. Our thanks to Hero of Winds, SpongeBoy1985, and Bonzo So21 for their request. Stay tuned as we give you more strategies to stealth your way through everything or nothing. And send us an email to cheat at g4tv.com to let us know who your favorite Bond girl of all time is. Careful when I want to. You know, with a partner helping you out, you'll have a better chance to die another day.
It's true, but even with two double-O agents, your mission doesn't get any easier. Here are a few tactics to help you in this co-op obstacle. Bond games have the added bonus of multiplayer options, where spies can team up and work together in cooperation mode. In Everything or Nothing, the co-op storylines actually revolve around the single-player missions, but this time you're at MI6 agents investigating nanotechnology production sites. Cheat viewer the end game over and his fellow spy friend are having trouble with the last chapter of the Tunisia mission called Last Stand. Here you'll have to find and dispatch M. Safo. The first two guards Safo leaves behind are easily defeated with a few punches. At the hallway exit, take out a sniper hiding on the balcony. Now you can both run through the courtyard clearing the area of ground soldiers while avoiding the rocket launcher fire from the balcony on the other end. With this area cleared, you can move to the next compound behind the double door switch. One agent should run to the right and take out the soldier with the rocket launcher while your partner handles the remaining soldiers. Next, you should go down the stairs in the center of the compound where there are two guards and another double switch door. Once you enter into this new room, split up. One agent going right and the other left. Stick to the walls as you fire on the soldiers in your way. These soldiers are pretty easy to take down. Just keep moving fast. You'll have a few more soldiers to rush past when you get to this doorway through the next room. Move down this walkway until you find a stairway. Go up the stairs and watch out for two guards. At the top of the stairs, you'll be back at the courtyard where you first started. There's a big gun on the upper level. One agent can man the gun and fire at the soldiers with rocket launchers in the far balconies while your partner runs below and attacks the enemies on the ground. He should aim for the far right corner of the courtyard, taking cover behind trees and firing on all the enemy soldiers he can. You don't want to use up all your ammo in the big gun, so both agents should fight together down in the courtyard until Safo makes his appearance with a big gun of his own. The best way to defeat Safo is for one agent to draw his fire on the ground level while the other attacks with the big gun on top. As long as you can continuously fire on Safo and avoid his attacks, you'll be the winning team. Congratulations, agents. Don't get too confident, though. Thanks to the end game over for his request. If you need any more co-op help, just send an email to cheat at g4tv.com and you'll get all the details on how to be the perfect MI6 agent. Forget the golden gun and everything or nothing. It's all about the platinum. We're going to show you how to get platinum rewards for some key missions. But first, it's a cheap popularity poll. This week's cheap popularity poll takes spies back to the days of GoldenEye 007 for the Nintendo 64. Once gamers completed the missions 1 through 9 on 00 Agent Mode, they could access all the cheat codes when they replayed the game. There was the All Guns code to unlock every weapon. You could be an invincible Bond and fly through the game without a scratch. Or be invisible where the enemies won't see you even when you're standing right in front of them. Attack with paintball bullets in paintball mode. Or check out line mode for sketch-like graphics. Next up is the Golden Gun, where one shot takes down any enemy or you can just give all the bad guys a big head in DK mode. Secret agents put down their controllers long enough to cast their votes for their favorite code. And the winning super spy code is... All Guns! At the cheat menu on the D-pad, enter down, left, C-stick up, D-pad right, left trigger plus D-pad down, left trigger plus D-pad left, left trigger plus D-pad up, C-stick left, D-pad left and C-stick down. Holding it down until you hear a quick chime as a confirmation. Now exit out of the cheat menu, then go back to see all guns appear. Turn all guns on and play through the mission again with every weapon in the game. For all the GoldenEye codes and more spy gadgets, check out the Cheat Sheet Master Database at g4tv.com slash cheat and cast your vote in the next Cheat Popularity Poll. And I'm shaken, not stirred, thanks to cheating. And I'm Tina Wood. I get to host with Corey Rouse, thanks to cheating. Welcome back to Cheat. We're infiltrating the world of everything or nothing to bring you an insider's guide to 007. That's right, Corey, but sometimes the world is just not enough. And what people really want is platinum. But only the best of the best get platinum rewards. But even 00 agents need help from time to time. An MI6 agent's success is usually determined on whether they survive the mission. In 007 Everything or Nothing, when you complete a mission, you'll earn gold and platinum rewards for achieving specific objectives. Earn gold on the 00 agent skill level to unlock the platinum mission objectives. Earning platinum is the ultimate test of skill. Objectives vary from mission to mission, but the platinum meter will indicate your progress as we lead you through some tougher platinums. 
In mission, an old friend. Vaughn must sneak through an enemy train without alerting the guards. To earn the platinum, you must complete the mission without taking any damage, and stealth attacks are the key. Avoid their line of sight and quickly stealth attack the first two guards, then hide and stealth the third. Remember to destroy all the computers before you move on. In the second car, stealth the first guard and take cover to shoot the two patrolling guards. In the third car, rush the first guard right away. Then hide and wait for the second one to turn his back before attacking. In the fourth car, stealth attack the first two guards and shoot the last guard. Switch on your thermal vision and immediately shoot the first guard in the fifth car. Take cover behind the barrel and pick off the guards till the car is clear to earn the platinum reward. But you still have to defeat Jaws afterwards to complete the mission. And finally, in Mission Serena St. Germain, Bond must rendezvous with a geologist. It's Bond! To earn the platinum, you must escape the patrols and race from the hotel to the base of the fortress in less than a minute 55 seconds. That's barely enough time to make the drive, even if you weren't being slowed down by the missile launching patrols walking your path. Switch on your Q cloak and immediately turn right for a shortcut to the winding road. Controls everything. Conserve your cloak as much as possible while still avoiding the patrols. Make a break straight through the fountain plaza until your battery runs out. Turn left here through the sunken alley to avoid the roadblock. Turn left to avoid the tank and skip the cinematic at the bottom of the hill. Jump off the cliff and off-road your way back up the hill. Turn left again and race through the barriers in the nick of time for the Platinum Reward. There are 27 Platinum Rewards to earn and Platinums are the key to unlocking cheats for 007 Everything or Nothing. So what are you going to do with all that Platinum? Are you going to buy diamonds that are forever? <laughs> are you going to license to kill? <laughs> <laughs> no! You're gonna get a bunch of cheat codes! <laughs> you take a look at these rewards. <laughs> when you're James Bond, you get gadgets and gizmos aplenty. Even if Q complains about them coming back damaged. You're suave, have style, and you're a real ladies' man. You're not afraid to go above and beyond the call of duty to get the job done. And when you have cheat codes, the job is even easier. All the codes in this game have to be earned the old-fashioned gamer way. They're unlockable features. And by being the best spy you could be and earning platinum ratings, you'll have all these goodies in no time. When you're at the mission select screen, you can go to the unlock menu option. Here you'll find gadgets, rewards, and cheats as options. The rewards section features production stills that are earned with gold ratings and unlockable characters for multiplayer mode. When you've earned 27 gold ratings, you'll also unlock the gallery. Here you can run around and explore a museum with concept artwork, props, and gadgets. You can even get a close-up look at all the Bond girls in the game. Under cheats, you'll find 13 cheat codes that can be used anytime during the game once you've gotten them unlocked with enough platinum ratings. But you can't use any cheat codes to earn higher ratings and unlock the next level. It's just not allowed when you're a proper spy like Bond. You'll get the golden gun as soon as you earn the first platinum rating. Just pause the game and enter circle, triangle, X, circle, triangle. You'll hear a low chime as a confirmation if you've entered the code correctly. Now with just one shot with this gun, enemies won't get back up. You can have all the weapons when you've got 17 platinum ratings. Just enter circle, triangle, X, X, circle while at the pause screen. Now your arsenal is well stocked and Bond is ready for any situation. You can have your new weapons cause double damage when you pause the game and enter circle, triangle, triangle, square, circle. For unlimited ammo, just enter circle, X, square, X, circle. The ultimate prize after you've earned 27 platinum ratings is the platinum gun. This weapon packs an explosive bang when you enter circle, square, square, circle, X. Away from the, the bad guys won't be able to escape this gunfire. If the driving levels are giving you trouble, you can give your car improved traction after earning three platinums when you enter circle, X, X, square, triangle. To permanently cloak your car, earn 13 platinums and enter circle, triangle, X, triangle, square. An invisible car is a must-have for any spy. To have all the codes, be sure to earn every platinum rating you can. And use all your gadgets to visit the Cheat Sheet Master Database at g4tv.com slash cheat, where you'll find a cheat code recap. We've got what it takes to make you as good a spy as James Bond. 
Nice prize. All right, that's it for this edition of Cheat. Remember, if you have any questions, you can check out the Cheat Sheet Master Database at g4techtv.com slash cheat. That's right. And while you're there, hit the message board or send an email to cheat at g4tv.com where you can request a code or walk there for your favorite game. Let's go. All right, thanks to Agent Wood for helping us out for today's show. Remember, this is Corey Rouse saying if life's got you down, throw in the God mode and keep kicking butt. We'll see you next time on Cheat. Okay. Go. Oh. along with the shows. You can win an iPod mini and other cool stuff. Go to g4techtv.com slash hyperactive and play along every weeknight at 11 Eastern, 8 Pacific. This is the story of a group of friends. I took it to my friend Kevin at like 2 a.m. I called him up at home. He's like, oh, let's do it. I said, I got, you know, we got to make a game console. Of course, Seamus walks in with this, this whole plan. Boom, here's the Xbox plan. So it's like, Great. Boy, I remember thinking, what have we gotten ourselves into? Who took on the leader in a billion dollar industry. So we're sitting in a room with Bill Gates and Steve Ballmer, and Steve Ballmer is saying, you're gonna lose all our money! Wow, we better get this right, otherwise it could potentially really screw up the industry. Xbox was the sexiest thing any Microsoft employee had ever heard of ever at the company, they all wanted to work on it. This is it, we're not looking back. I'm waiting for my Xbox. This is the remarkable story of the Xbox. The Xbox begins with the driving force behind it, Seamus Blackley. Seamus grows up in New Mexico and early on develops an interest in the world of gaming. I can remember very distinctly the feeling of playing my Atari 2600 and not really wanting to finish the games or to play them so much, but really wanting to take that excitement that I felt and like write my own games. And, and when I got my, my Apple, my mom likes to tell a story, when they gave me the Apple II for Christmas, I stayed up for 72 hours straight. The moment they gave it to me, it was plugged into the TV and I, and I, I actually fell asleep like on it the first night because uh, I was so desperate to write a game. Despite his love for games, his career steers him into another direction. I was working as a physicist and uh, I was doing high energy physics and there was this giant particle accelerator that was going to be built in Texas called the Superconducting Super Collider in Waxahachie, Texas. And that was, that was my future and everybody else's future who was doing experimental high energy physics in the U.S. at that time. That was, that was what it was about for the most part. And it got canceled. It got canceled by Congress. With no job on the horizon, Seamus applies for a job posting on campus. It was Looking Glass Technologies. They're, they needed somebody to rewrite a uh, car physics model for a car and driver game they were working on. And so I went over there and uh, met all the guys working on Ultima Underworld and, and met the Ned Lerner, who was a, an idol of mine from Chuck Yeager's Flight Simulator in days past. And started working on car physics. And, you know, that grew into the physics system and System Shock and AI stuff and, uh, and Flight Unlimited and, and uh, Underworld 2 and all that stuff. But new management flies into a completely different direction. So, you know, these game guys, you know, we're going to bring in a professional management team. And at the time I was saying, look, we need to do combat version of Flight Unlimited. I really want to do that. And the management decided that instead they wanted to compete with Microsoft Flight Simulator. So I started looking for a job, and I eventually got recruited to go work at DreamWorks. 
At DreamWorks, Seamus goes to work on a game based on the smash hit movie Jurassic Park by Steven Spielberg. The future looks bright for Seamus, but there are storm clouds on the horizon. So there I did a bunch of stuff culminating in working on Trespasser. Pack hunter, quite vicious and quite intelligent. Screwed that up pretty well and, you know, didn't do a lot of things that I, I know I would uh, I want to do today. I can do this. Trespasser is released in 1998 and its flaws are obvious. Critics and fans are disappointed and Seamus loses faith in himself. Eight left. You know, after Trespasser, I got death threats. Heavier than I thought. There was a huge backlash. It was the very dawn of fan sites on the internet. It was the dawn of the sort of uh, culture of first-person shooters. And everybody expected it to be a shooter. Seven. Six. I mean, first of all, they expected it to be finished, which it wasn't. But they expected it to be a shooter, and it wasn't. It was really different. So people were really pissed off. I mean, people really hated that game. I mean, there were some people who really loved it. And there were a lot of people who just hated it and just... I figured that my career was over. It really did. It was an incredibly painful time. And a turning point. Seamus decides to make a change and heads north. And I thought I'd just go hide. Go hide at Microsoft for a while. I chose a program manager job in the, in the graphics division because I just wanted to get away from games. But he's not able to resist games for long. In 1999, Sony announces the release of their newest console, the PlayStation 2. And enterprising Seamus has an idea. Well, there were rumors of, of Sony, um, you know, releasing this, this, this new version of the PlayStation. That it was going to kill PC graphics outright. And, uh, you know, I've been doing 3D for a long time, and 3D on the PC is unstoppable. I mean, it's just continuously, continuously innovating, continuously feeding back on itself, continuously progressing. And it just seemed ludicrous to me. It became clear to me that, you know, very few companies in the world could do something as bold as take on Sony, and Microsoft was one of them. But it was, became incredibly clear to the other guys that I talked to about it that we had an opportunity to make a game console which had the business potential of a game console, but had the tool support and the power for artists of the PC and of, and of, and of the sort of traditional offline rendering community. And that was really the spark. And at 35,000 feet in the air, Seamus is inspired. So, you know, one night, you know, for whatever reason, I was sitting on an airplane and, and, you know, I got hit by cosmic radiation. And I wrote this thing up and I took it to my friend Kevin at like 2 a.m. after I landed. I called him up at home. He's like, oh, it's a good I said, I got, you know, we got to make a game console. Kevin Bacchus, a project manager at DirectX, sees the potential. Initially, there were really four of us working on Xbox. Seamus, myself, uh, Otto Berkus, who ran the graphics development for, um, for DirectX, and Ted Hase, who was my boss, who was in charge of evangelism for DirectX. We obviously went and talked to Ed Fries extensively about what his thoughts would be. Ed Fries, the man in charge of the games division at Microsoft, is immediately impressed. They approached me and said, hey, uh, if we made this console, would you, uh, would you support us? Would you help us get it through uh, upper management? And would you uh, help make the games for us? They're pretty persuasive. They had a plan that, um, that I thought was pretty exciting. The group embarks on a crusade to bring the console to the masses. We had day jobs. We had stuff we were supposed to be doing, right? And we just weren't doing it, right? We were inviting ourselves to meetings. And we thought, God, you know, if they're making a device for the home, it has to be Xbox. It has to be this thing we're thinking of, which at the time we were calling the direct Xbox, which is how it got the name Xbox. The group pushes the idea up through the ranks at Microsoft, eventually reaching the top. Mr. Bill Gates. The first time that we talked to Bill Gates about Xbox, I think he was immediately very taken by the opportunity, by the chance to create something that was technologically superior to anything that was out there, and really focused on a single task. Bill got it right away. I mean, Bill was Bill's a very sharp guy. So he became one of our biggest allies from the beginning. It was just awesome. It was the most awesome sort of you know support ever, and they just kept on pushing it. Bill Gates sends a memo endorsing the Xbox project. For Seamus, Kevin, and Ed, the moment of truth finally arrives. Wow, we better get this right, otherwise it could potentially really screw up the industry. By 1999, the Xbox is a legitimate project. Software giant Microsoft. 
assembles a team to oversee key elements of the Xbox production. Jay Aller came on board to run the development efforts to, to create the operating system for, for the device, the, all the development tools, that sort of thing. And he brought on board a number of people in key positions to kind of round out that group. It was still just a, an internal project at Microsoft that wasn't something that had been officially announced. It was still very much under wraps because they themselves weren't sure they were going to do it. But the very fact that Microsoft was considering coming into the games console market was a big deal. It could potentially be a bad thing if, if, if Microsoft decides they're going to launch like basically a home PC, branded a game console and put a bunch of PC games on it or something like that, which to those guys who are very smart guys at Microsoft but don't have a lot of context in the game business could well have happened. And so we felt a lot of responsibility to be sure that that, that wouldn't happen. And the response from the gaming community is encouraging. When we went out to publishers and developers is that we've been kind of secretly meeting with all these guys for months and months and months, refining the, the idea, you know? What do you guys think about this? Oh, that's a crazy idea. What do you think about that? Oh, that's great. As push comes to shove, Gates makes a historical decision. It was a meeting where Valentine's Day was a month before GDC, and it was a point at which we're going to announce it at GDC or we're going to cancel this project because we're not going to be ready in time. It was just the final time. It's like, look, you know, you have to say go or no go now. Starting up a console and spending billions of dollars to enter a new market is a difficult undertaking for any company, even a company the size of Microsoft. So we come into this meeting. It's scheduled to run from 4 to 6 o'clock on Valentine's Day. And Bill is just like immediately on the attack. But what do you mean it won't run Windows? Oh, did we forget to tell you that part? And you find yourself sitting in a room with Bill Gates and Steve Ballmer. And Steve Ballmer is right here, like, you know, with the sweat standing on his forehead saying, you know, you're going to lose all our money! We all have dinner reservations and we, we're in big trouble because it's Valentine's Day and we're not home and the time is going by. And then in the last five minutes, the meeting just like turned, turned around like 180 degrees. And you know, I don't know if Bill and Steve had this planned the whole time. And all of a sudden, they're all looking around at each other. We got to do this. We got to do this. And then they're all getting excited, which is fun to be part of. In March of 2000, Bill Gates stands on stage at the Game Developers Conference and announces what many had already suspected. I'm announcing the Xbox. The modest tagline here is the future of console gaming. This is a, a huge milestone for us. All they have to do now is accomplish everything they said they could. Boy, I remember thinking, what have we gotten ourselves into? You know, it, it once, once the product was finally approved and there were absolutely no other reviews or approvals processes, once Bill Gates and Steve Ballmer said, look, you know, this is it, we're not looking back. Then the really hard work came in. Every assumption that we had, every plan had to be tested. And it was challenging. You have this giant company behind you, Microsoft behind you, right? You get Microsoft like going in a direction, you better be sure it's the right direction, right? So we started feeling like, wow, we better get this right, otherwise it could potentially really screw up the industry. There was a lot of skepticism about, you know, were we really serious about doing this? Was, was there ever even going to be a console? There was skepticism about whether we would be able to hit our launch date, whether the performance would be what we said it would be, whether it would, in fact, be easy to program. At every step along the way, there was a constant proving process. We had to show games very early because, you know, we needed to demonstrate what the game was going to be. We had to show that it wasn't a PC. You know, we built the system for developers. There is nobody out there who wouldn't tell you the NVIDIA chip was the hottest thing in the world. Nobody. All consoles are essentially computers. There's a processor, there's a graphics chip, there's an audio chip. All the things that you see in a PC are evident in a console, but they're very different. They're very focused on a very specific thing, on gaming. And sometimes it's not what's on the inside, but the outside that counts. In January 2001, the public gets its first look at the controller and industrial design of the Xbox. Of course, we didn't want the Xbox to look uncool. We wanted it to look powerful. We did a lot of design studies. One of the things that enthusiast press was the controller. Some people didn't mind the fact that the original controller, which they called Duke, was bigger. But I think to a lot of the gamers, just they just kind of felt that eh, it was just a little too big. And they've subsequently gone with the S-Type controller, which they developed for Japan, which was definitely a better. As the launch date approaches, Microsoft's marketing machine shifts into high gear. 
Microsoft faced this huge dilemma with how they were going to position themselves in the market. Do we brand it Xbox, but you know, do we have Microsoft on the box? Do we use Bill Gates? Is, is Bill Gates liked by gamers, isn't he? So I think they had a huge consumer marketing identity crisis that they sort of needed to address right away. Anticipation builds on November 12, 2001 in Times Square. I remember walking across the street from the WWF place over to uh, the Toys R Us to get ready for the midnight thing. Bill was there and a couple other people. And Xbox is just everywhere. Up on the lights, every billboard in Times Square, all the big electronic signs, and there's Xbox here, Xbox there. And it was just, I don't know, it's one of those kind of surreal moments. At 12.01 a.m., Bill Gates presents the first Xbox to a customer who had been waiting for hours outside. Yeah, it's just one of those moments in your life that you're just glad to be part of. But Seamus has other things to worry about. Well, I was super nervous because I was going to propose to my wife that night. You know, that was, that was the thing I was really nervous about. And I had arranged for Bill Gates to hold my engagement ring, right? So he had my engagement ring in pocket. And... Bill had called me that afternoon and said, you know, what if she says no? Do you have a backup plan in case she says no? And so I'm thinking, God, is she going to say no? Because I, no, I had no doubts up until that moment. I was like, oh, no, oh, no, no, no. She'll probably say yes. It'll all be OK. Frankly, compared to that, the launch of the Xbox is almost anticlimactic. You know, for me, the launch was all about getting on my knee and you know, having the most fabulous woman on earth say she'd marry me. With a successful console launch and an engagement, Blackley has achieved everything he has hoped for. But the fate of the Xbox is far from certain. This is an Xbox! It's number one! With the Xbox successfully launched in time for Christmas 2001, the future of the system now lies in the hands of the developers. Well, I think the, the number one thing that we wanted to achieve was for people who got an Xbox to just be blown away. That has to be the ultimate goal, right? You know, we talked to the people in line in New York, and they were really excited about Xbox. The first Christmas, all the hardcore gamers are going to go out and they're going to buy it because it got it. It's new. It's exciting. There's a lot of press about it. They got to see if it's if it really lives up to the hype. But you don't want to take it home and like open it up and and have it. Sit. And that actually happened with a couple of other console launches, right? People got excited with the technology. You take it home, and of course, technology isn't enough, right? It goes on and makes the boot noise, and then you put in a game that's not so great, and you're like, whoa, they went 300 bucks. Oh, that was awesome. They have to feel incredibly happy about it. The thing sold out everywhere, and it was just, you know, a, a giant success. The real question on any console is how it does in subsequent years, you know, especially the second Christmas. That's really important. That's when, to some extent, the real battle happens. Because everybody has a lot of units out there, a lot of consoles, you know, and the generation of games that come out into that installed base appear. So what happens in the later years is really kind of dependent on the quality of the games. That is, is something that's, you know, just a very magical and very difficult thing to predict in advance. And then it's a real creative contest, right? Then it's, it's not about the specs of the hardware. It's not about how cool your TV campaign is, you know? It's not about any of those things. It's about which games you have and, and are your fans happy or not. So I would argue the real worker is then. If you got a great game and it's only available on Xbox and it's the thing that everybody's excited about, then they're going to go out and buy Xboxes. Microsoft's development team, Bungie, provides the must-have game for the season. Halo was, was awesome. We're not gonna make it! We'll make it. Pull up! Pull up! Played a lot of games in my life, and this is a game I could just sit and play and play and, and have a great time. So I really felt pretty confident that we were gonna be able to come out and really surprise people.
Despite fierce competition, Microsoft manages to sell 1.5 million consoles and nearly 5 million Xbox games by Christmas. Developers take advantage of the console's hardware abilities to create distinct and innovative games. Ah, camera! No, 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 no! That means turn on the lights, idiot! I'd have to say that right now my favorite game is a game from Microsoft Studios that just came out called... Uh, Kung Fu Chaos! It's a fighting game, but it's kind of a party game. And to see that kind of, of work and craftsmanship going to a game produced for something that kind of we had had an idea about, you know, three years ago, four years ago, it's just you know, astounding. In the fall of 2002, Xbox Live is launched. We've been cooking this thing up very, you know, from the get-go. Three years ago when we conceived of Xbox, we wanted to bring it online. You know, online gaming is going to be the big next step in, in video gaming. And a celebrity event is held. These are always really fun parties. Bring it on. Yeah. Yeah, I'm excited. It's so exciting and it really improves the hand-eye coordination. It's awesome, man. It's awesome. Super fun. Great games. Realistic. Uh, I think that's off the chain. Yeah, I love this stuff. Gift bag. In my mind, I connect the dots thinking about Xbox. Even as the Xbox continues to succeed, preparations are made for a new system. We're deep, deep in planning right now for the next version of Xbox. Is this guy serious? I actually probably spend more time right now when I'm in the office. I probably spend more time right now on Xbox 2 than I spend on Xbox 1, if you can believe that. Whatever. And part of that is because we got to do it right this time. Right. We want to have enough time to make sure that we're not like just insane at the end. we have the content portfolio really planned out and we have the games lined up and that we have this machine that's not only going to be successful in the US but can be successful everywhere in the world and that that's what's going on. Although Kevin and Seamus have left to start their own development company, just taking a look back is sometimes the greatest reward. It was a mixture because on the one hand it was really really hard. But on the other hand, I mean, it was probably the best time I've ever had in my life because we were out doing what we wanted to do. I mean, you know, very few times do you get the opportunity to actually see kind of your, you know, a dream that you had come together and so many people come together to make it happen. Like looking back to, you know, 1999, it's just unbelievable. I went to a Tokyo Game Show and there were giant Xbox banners everywhere, right? It's unbelievable. And you think back to 1999, Take back to me and Kevin and Otto and Ted. These four guys like sitting in a room eating jelly beans, you know? Ah, come on. That's a wild ride. That's a really amazing thing. So I guess for me personally, there's that. I, I, I can't really hold it to an absolute scale because it's really emotional. So it's just, uh, yes, it's nearly unbelievable. Xbox is the next generation of video gaming. It's the only controller I've ever touched that actually like molds to your hand. Dead or alive, dead or alive. Yeah, that's that would be cool. No, 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 I let him play all the time. It keeps him home. It's awesome, it's the best console ever, man. <laughs>